name. Amen. Amen. Give it up. Thank you. All right. All right. Good morning, men, and welcome to Forge. We're glad you're here. <clears throat> we may not have any who are with us for the first time today, but uh, Trey Etheridge, where are you? Where are you? You're here for another, t- standing up in the back. See that big guy back there? Trey Etheridge, give him a round of applause. <laughs> Trey, good to see you again. Trey is from this area, been here for a lot of years, moved over to the coast, is, in, is leading men's ministry uh, on the coast, and is, in, is going to be handing out two opportunities for you. One is in Gainesville, and one is in the King Center in Melbourne, Tim Tebow and Zach Williams. So these are available for you. And uh, so, Trey, thanks for being with us today. And we, we pray that those events really reach out to guys in a big way, big way. Thank you. Shout out to Oviedo City Church, who are with us here live streaming right now, and to uh, Forge in where? Down on 50 at Waterford Lakes, Tuesday, or excuse me, Wednesday afternoon. So we give a shout out to you guys. You are Forge, and we're glad to have you with us. We're in a series, Kingdom Warrior, what's the word, guys? Discipline. Take a look at that logo. I love that. The sharpening that takes place. Uh, warriors are disciplined people. We're going to be looking at kingdom warrior disciplines. We, uh, last week, we took a look at our updated daily appointment with God. And um, uh, warriors are disciplined people. They have to be sharpened every day. But as we think about who we are as Forge, uh, you know the mantra, the elevator speech, We are about building great men who build great men as God defines greatness. And so we're going to be looking at that second part of that uh, this morning. We're about building great men who build great men as God defines greatness as we look at our, our brand new evangelistic booklet that we have put together. I'll be getting to this, and you have that in front of you, but you have the outline in front of you. And before we look at that, I want to lay a foundation for us today. And uh, I got a couple of introductory comments for us, a few truths just to get out there real quick. I got I to gotta move quickly today, so it's going to be a little bit of cognitive glut. Are you ready? Here we go. Great men, as God defines greatness, are, are disciplined men. You, you, no man that I've ever met can become a great man unless there is discipline in his life. And I love 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily discipline is of some value, godliness is of value for every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Train yourself to be godly. Uh, the New American Standard says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. The New King James says, exercise yourself for the purpose of godliness. It comes from the Greek word gumnazo, gumnazo, from which we get gymnasium. And the whole idea of exercise, training, discipline. Uh, And in the first century, the Greeks, how did they do their sports? In what physical condition? Naked, yeah. So get that out of your mind. Um, Get that out of your mind. Don't go there. Uh, But uh, the whole idea of discipline, and it's interesting that Paul is telling the young pastor Timothy this, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You ready for some, uh, ready for some grammar? When he calls him to discipline himself or to train himself, it's a, it's an era, it's a present active imperative, present active imperative. In other words, Timothy, train yourself today, train yourself tomorrow, keep training yourself always. A present active means you got to take responsibility for it, and it's an imperative, which means it's a command, not a suggestion. Young pastor Timothy, train yourself to be godly today, tomorrow, Every day, and this is a great application for all of us, isn't it? Uh, And that's what we are to do, to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. This morning, this idea of discipline, I was doing my daily appointment with God, and I read uh, 2 Thessalonians, 
Two places in 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul says, we did not act among you in an undisciplined manner. He said, when we were with you Thessalonians, we were disciplined. And then he says, but there's some among you who are undisciplined. In, in just a few verses, he uses that, that twice. So discipline is important for us. And, and then he, in Proverbs 15, 32, catch this one, guys. This blows me away. He who neglects discipline despises himself. Men who neglect godly discipline in one sense despise God, that's true, in one sense despise others, but in the biggest sense, Proverbs says, here's the wisdom, if you don't discipline yourself, you despise yourself. You've got a low self-image. You don't care about yourself. You're not taking care of yourself spiritually. Wow, that hits me. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And we can be disciplined and relational at the same time, right? Can you be a disciplined man and be a, 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 a cool guy to hang out with? Yes, you can. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But you can still be disciplined. You can smile and say, hey, I got to go do this. You can. All right. Second introductory truth. Building great men always starts with evangelism. Always, right? If we're going to build great men who build great men, it starts with evangelism, right? Because no man becomes a great man as God defines greatness unless God has been working in his life. We all agree on that. Does that make sense? You got to be a Christian to become a great man as God defines greatness. No pagan is great in God's eyes. And so that just, that just makes sense and it's important to keep in, in, in mind. Now you can be called great and not be great. Right? Alexander the Great was called great. Was he great? Died at 32. He was a great leader, but a horrible man, really. He was a great warrior. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, died 32 in a drunken stupor and sick and all that kind of stuff. Herod the Great, Herod the Great in the time of Christ was called great because he was a great builder. Some of his structures still are standing today without roofs. I've walked through some of them up on Masada. He was a great builder, but he was one of the most wicked men that ever lived. I've got a whole list. Google it. It's, it's a fascinating list, all the people that are called great, you know. I remember when I was in junior high, I'd walk around and say, yeah, what, they'd say, what's your name? Peter Alexander the Great. <laughs> was I? No. <laughs> Will that ever? No. But the reality is, is that you can be called great and not be great. And only God, God's greatness can be built in us if we're godly men. Train yourself to be godly. Third introductory truth is this. It takes a man to reach a man, doesn't it? To, to help build another man uh, generally speaking, and I, I put this <clears throat> generally speaking because I know some of you have been led to Christ by women. My mom led me to Christ. I prayed the prayer to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord with my mother at eight years of age, but it wasn't my mother that influenced me the most spiritually. It was the male preachers in my life. It was the male disciplers in my life. It was the male mentors in my life that influenced me the most. Generally speaking, it takes a man to build another man. It's just the way the gender thing works. God ordained it that way. I didn't. It's generally speaking the truth. And so it takes a man to reach a man and to get the man in the discipleship process. And that's why you are absolutely crucial in the evangelism and in the discipleship process of other men. Let that sink in. You, would you let, let the weight of that sink in? That generally speaking, it takes a man to reach a man. So let's do a little talking about evangelism as we think about uh, reaching out to other men and how important we are. Evangelism is simply telling other people the good news of, of, of salvation in Jesus Christ alone and then inviting them into the kingdom 
uh, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me give you some words real quick here uh, on evangelism. There they are. They're already up. There's three main words uh, for evangelism. The first one is euangelizo or euangelizomai. In the Greek, you can impress your friends uh, by using it. You know what the real word for evangelism is. It's or euangelizomai. Don't worry about that. The Greeks sometimes did their ending word doesn't matter. You see it both ways in the New Testament. You angelizo, angelizo, anga, anga, ang, 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 angel. It's related to the word angel that means what? Messenger. Uh, messenger. You angelizo. Uh, the, ne- the next word is you angelion, which simply is translated gospel most of the times in the New Testament, and then three times in the New Testament, euangelizeste, uh, euangelizes evangelists. Philip, in Acts 21.8, we see was an evangelist. Evangelism is a spiritual gift in Ephesians 4.11, right? As some people have that gift of evangelism. They are evangelists in the sense that whenever... God uses them in a unique way. There are some guys that are teachers, some guys that are servants. God uses them in a unique way. But some guys are evangelists. Billy Graham was an evangelist. Billy Graham preaches and dozens and dozens of people come forward and accept Christ. Because he told the good news and they accept. I tell the good news all the time. I never have crowds like that. Right? Why? I'm a Bible teacher. He's an evangelist. And you may say, well, you don't, I'm not an evangelist. That's right. Paul says to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 4, 5, he says, do the work of an evangelist. He says that to Timothy. Why? Timothy was a pastor, probably a teacher, probably not a gifted evangelist. But he says, do the work of evangelism. Now, let me me tell you this. One of the most counter-cultural things we can do is to evangelize. you, you got to understand this, and this has been astonishing to me as I've been restudying this whole idea, but the, the, the reality that evangelism, uh, the word itself, euangelion, euangelizis, euangelizis, all those, those words, those words were counter-cultural in the first century when the New Testament was being used. The early church hijacked those words. Why? Because Emperor Claudius, when he became the emperor, it was said, he brings good news. When the Romans elevated a new Caesar, it was, it was euangelizo, it was good news. The king, we have a new emperor. And now the church of Jesus Christ comes along. And what are they saying? Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Jesus is the king and he has the good news. Every picking time and a a Christian in the first century went around talking about the good news of faith in Jesus Christ. He was making a political statement. Read the New Testament through political eyes And you will see that the early church consistently said, we follow a new king and the kingdom of God is here now. Yes, we're citizens of other kingdoms, but the kingdom we really follow, the king we really follow is King Jesus. Let the weight of that sink in. That when we evangelize, we are saying to everybody around us, we are not following a government on earth. We're submissive as citizens of the country in which we're in. But make no mistake about it. We have a loyalty that transcends those earthly nations because we're exiles and strangers on this planet. And that's why when Jesus, just before he left the planet, he he said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make what? Disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Evangelism is the process. Evangelism is the beginning process of making disciples. 
To become a disciple, you have to first be evangelized. You have to hear the good news of salvation alone in Jesus Christ. And then you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ, get baptized to show that you are now a new follower of Christ, and then be taught all that he commanded. Disciples are not dabblers. Disciples are all in. But the, the discipleship process begins with evangelism, doesn't it? Say yes. Yes. It begins with evangelism. Discipleship begins with evangelism. And as we bring people to faith in Christ, uh, we, we are making disciples who change the world around us. All right, so you and I are in this process. Jesus says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Isn't that great news? That as we go out as evangelists, making disciples... And by the way, when we talk about becoming great men as God defines greatness, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about discipleship, aren't we? That we're making disciples, that a great man is a disciple, not a dabbler. We're not pew sitters. We're not chair sitters. We're not worship attenders. We're disciples. We're followers of Jesus Christ. That means all in, here and forever. Okay, and, and, and so the Holy Spirit is in us, through us, as we do this process. Now, why do evangelism? Two reasons, real quick, going real quick, and I told you it was cognitive glut today, you ready? Why do evangelism? Jesus commanded us, and he uses us. He wants to use us. Two reasons. He commands us to do it. That's good enough, isn't it? Because he's the risen Savior. It, whatever he commands is worth doing. Would you agree? You have to agree. If you're a Bible believer, uh, Jesus says, do it. Uh, and, and, and so we do it. Acts 1, 6 through 8. Here's the command again. Uh, when they came together, this is right after the resurrection. When they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, hey, let me tell you, let me unpack all the details about the kingdom. Let me tell you what, when exactly it's going to happen and in what order. He goes, this is not for you to know that stuff. That's above your pay grade. You and us will be my witnesses. The Greek word is martyrus, martyrs. You'll be my witnesses uh, in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Get out there and go do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you will receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses all over to the end of, uh, of, of the world. And so there's the command, right? That's the command. And he uses us. Guys, here's the exciting thing. It's not, don't, don't let that be a guilt thing. Let that be an exciting thing. You're part of the family business. When he redeemed you, he brought you into the family business. You got a slot. You got a role. This is what we get. There's nothing more joyful. I mean, I love it when somebody comes up after Forge and says, man, I, that was a true, I didn't realize that before. I'm going to start applying that to my life. I love it when, when, when Christian men get biblical truth and they, they make changes. I love that. But I'll tell you, it says in the New Testament when, that, when somebody comes to faith in Christ, the angels in heaven are going, yippee. There's nothing more enjoyable when somebody bows the knee for Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just pumped. And so from God's standpoint, see, God not only ordains who comes, but how they come. Could he have done it without us? Can he save souls without us? He could, of course. He's the sovereign God of the universe, but he hasn't chosen to do that. He has chosen to use us. And so we see in Acts 13, 44 through 48, I don't have time to read that whole thing, but Peter uh, and, 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 uh, is doing, a, uh, excuse me, Paul is, is in ministry and the missionary journeys, and he's out there preaching the gospel and is powerful uh, to, the, to the Gentiles. Um, uh, in verse 48, when, when, he, when he gives the message that, that non-Jews can become Christians, the Gentiles are going, yes. I mean, we can become Christians too. You don't have to become a Jew first. Good. No circumcision for crying out loud. That's a good thing. They don't have to obey the law. The law they can't obey the law. Uh, but they can come straight to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And it says this. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. 
You see, God is at work ahead of us out there, uh, and he knows who he has appointed, and he brings them, uh, and discipleship begins with a lot of people in life involved. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says to the Corinthians, because they were developing this, oh, yeah, I follow Peter, I follow Paul. Paul says this, what's Apollos? He was a gifted communicator. What is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants. Servants through whom you believed. Did you catch that? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Yes, the Bible tells us to respect our leaders in the Lord, but who is the one doing the whole thing? It is God. But we get the plant the seed of the gospel. We get to water the seed of the gospel. You might have shared the, the gospel with somebody and, and, and somebody else might be the one that actually gets to harvest that guy. Big deal, doesn't matter. We're servants through whom people believe. God has ordained who's gonna believe and how. God's process is to use the second causes of his people to present the gospel. So that's the third point. Who does evangelism? Who does evangelism? You know now, right? All of us. The disciples. The, we're all ministers. You are an ordained minister. You are an ordained evangelist. Ministers, messengers, and managers of our time, treasures, and talents to be good stewards of the gospel. We're all in, we're all in this. Can you imagine? See, is there a genius to that or what? 100% mobilized evangelistic force? Every Christian is an evangelist, a disciple maker. Now, how does evangelism work? Real quick, uh, God's rule. How does evangelism work? How does somebody get converted? Number one, God prepares the human heart to believe. John 6, 37, all whom the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. God goes ahead of us and prepares the heart of those who are his. Then he changes the human heart to receive him. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. I'm going fast, I know. But the point is, nobody gets faith and salvation by, by what they did. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. It's a grace gift. That's what grace is, receiving what you don't deserve. And then God's role also is preserving them. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. Every Christian should believe in eternal security uh, because it's what God does in the heart, not what we do in the heart. And so God uh, then fourthly develops the human heart forever. Therefore, Philippians 2, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Catch this, for it is God who is at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. So if, if you're growing, it's because the work of God in your heart. That's God's role. What's our role? Um, <clears throat> our role, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 17, is to help people understand the gospel and present it in a way that is clear and reverent and applicable. Let me ask you again, does God have to use you for salvation in somebody's life? No. Has he chosen that methodology? Yes. And I don't care if you're Catholic, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, non-denominational. God uses the second causes of his people to do it. There it is. And so that's why we put together this little booklet, because we want 100% mobilized force. Who best to reach a man than a man? Who best to reach a man than a man? Uh, and many of you already know this. Many of you are doing this. Uh, but as we think of the disciplines of the Christian life, we want to give a tool to you guys. So that's why we put this together. But notice this booklet, and I want you to take it and read it. I'm going to go over it real quick. I want you to take it and read it. Notice that what we have done in this evangelistic booklet uh, is we have come at evangelism and the need to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We've come at it from our perspective as seeking to help develop men. So this is, this is not something that I'm going to sit down with with a woman, all right? 
Uh, if I'm doing that, I, I don't have a booklet for women. Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay leading women to Christ. First, one, first person I brought to Christ, I uh, got to be used to bring to Christ, was a woman. I told you about it. She walked into my office said, can I accept Jesus Christ as Savior? I said, sure. And I take the credit for that to this day. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot. I know men, I'm called to reach men, okay, so there it is. You, uh, we're called to reach men. It takes a man to reach a man. And so, uh, but we're coming at it from the standpoint of manhood. We live in a day and age where there is an absolute crisis in the area of manhood in America today. Now, I don't know, I don't know if you agree with that, but you need to understand that there is. It's a crisis. We are at a point in America, it has never been worse, where men do not understand what it means to be a man. And one of the ways uh, that uh, we can reach men is through talking about manhood today. Mark Nelson's planning a church. He was one of our interns here. He's planting a church out in Chuliota. And he did uh, a pancake breakfast uh, on Saturday morning. There were 50 people there. It was great. Once the sheriff's department and other people heard about it, they go, breakfast, I'm there, you know. <laughs> it was great. And they reached out. There were, that's one good methodology of reaching out to people in a community. Other churches are doing different evangelistic methods to reach out. Our evangelistic method is to talk to men about manhood. It's a crisis. And so this booklet can help you, help you do that. If somebody asks you, what's Forge about? You could take one of these booklets, and you only have one here today, but we'll have more in the future. You can say, well, this isn't what we're about. And you can take them and let them read it. You don't have to walk through it with them right then and there. So this is what Forge is about. We're about building great men. How does that happen? Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. That's where it starts. Uh, and, 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 and if you, if you, if nobody asks you what is Forge or what are you all about, and you can, you can be proactive in starting and initiating conversations, can't you? But a lot of times, where do you start you know, you're a deep, dark sinner, Lee. You need Jesus. But you know that already. I've told you that for years, and you accept that. Uh, you, you know, so, but you don't start there. A lot of times we start with the felt need of the person. A lot of times it's building a relationship with a guy. Somebody said, I never learned anything. Oh, it was Lou Holtz. I never learned anything by talking. I only learn things by asking questions. You want to get into a guy's life and talk about Jesus Christ? Ask questions. Get to know him. Where are you from? What do you do? Tell me about your family. What I like to do is I like to get as soon as I can. Hey, tell, where were you raised? What was your family like? Tell me about your dad. Ooh. That's where, that's where, tell me family. They, they, they can do all that. You start talking about dad. Oh, did you, were you raised in a church? Yeah, what was that like? Do you go to church now? Um... Another thing I do is to talk about manhood with people and just talk about, gosh, man, it's hard to be a man today, isn't it? What do you think a real man is? Uh, how, how do we know what a real man is? We got we to become adept at asking questions and moving into other men's lives. You say, I'm not spiritual. I, duh. But you are because the Holy Spirit is at work in you, right? You're not perfect. Uh, is there a perfect man in this room? God uses imperfect people to do it. So I, I, just, I learned a long time ago, I'm never going to have my mind completely perfect, my mind pure. I'm never going to be completely pure to, to be able to be that witness for other people. I just got to enter in. Just got to build relationships. Got to make contacts with men, talk to them. And so when I get to the subject of manhood, that's why then I go here. You know, what do men really want deep down? Deep down, and that's a good question to ask men. What is it that men really want deep down? Well, I know sex, beer, those kinds of things, success, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you get beyond that, what I like to say to guys is I say, you know what, what I think men really want is I think they want to be great, but I think they also want to be real men. And I think lurking in the background of every man is this sense that he's still a little boy who never grew up and never was affirmed and never was deeply loved and has got all kinds of issues inside and he's plain that he's confident. Every man I ever talked to, I, I, give, me a, give me long enough. 
because I've been around since the Apostle Paul. So give, give, give me long enough and I can find the hurt and I can tell you my hurt. Feel around the rim of a man's life and you'll find the cracks eventually. But deep down, one of the things that most men really want to know that there are men. Um, all men were once boys, says author James Dickey, and trying to find ways to be men. At Forge, we really believe that men want to be men. Uh, why is our manhood pursuit so difficult? See, these are, this, this is, you give it to a guy, say, hey, this is what we do at Forge. I'd love if you'd read this and we could get together and talk about it sometime. You don't have to go through it with them, you could. But you, see, you know, at Forge, we want to be real men. Why is the manhood process so difficult? Well, what are the marks of true manhood? You know, that, that's another thing I ask you. What, what is a true man anyway? Isn't it great when you start asking guys questions? You never know what they're going to say. Are you happy with your manhood? What is a true man anyway? Well, at Forge, we talk about the five marks. And... Uh, and that's why we go over them and over and over them. And so we have in there uh, the five marks of manhood. And then, and, 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 then, and then how does a man become a real man? Why? why is becoming a real man so difficult? Well, here we have the Christian answer. We have the Christian answer. And the Christian answer is you've got to be in a relationship with the God of the universe so he can triumph over sin in your life and set you free to become the man you want to be. That's what this booklet is about. And I encourage you to take it, read it, think it through, and begin to craft your own way of making a connection into the lives of other people, other men. Maybe you have some guys that you've been talking to and they don't want to come to Forge for obvious reasons. It's early in the morning. Or they're not a Christian. Don't tell them it's a Bible study. Tell them it's a movement of men who are seeking to become real men. We study the Bible. That's our, our base. But we're not a simple Bible study. We're more than that. We're a movement of men who want to help other men become real men. By meeting their, their Savior and Creator. So I love what I do. Get beyond talking about weather and sports. Oscar Wilde said this, conversation about the weather is the last refuge of the unimaginative. <laughs> sports is real close to that. Wait a minute. Dudes, get to manhood and you could get to God. Talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here on time. I promise. Got to get you guys out of here. Hit the bricks. Uh, before we do, let's wrap it up. Um, you know the Forge Essentials, and uh, so I'm not going to go over those again today, but uh, Trey, again, Trey Etheridge is going to be back talking about two really good opportunities to invite friends. Uh, go yourself to have your manhood stretched and to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, today, as you know, we always have... We always have the After Forge Service Project, which is what? Tables, I know. All right, today it's a 100% service project today. I know, I know. Dave Cutlidios over here. Dave, hold up that, hold up that. What? 
Kenny Mack, where are you, Kenny? Uh, Kenny, the guy with the beard back there, man. Looks like Benjamin Warfield, the great theologian. I love it. All of these tables have got to go in that back room. They're having a funeral tomorrow. So the chairs stay up, the tables go down, and we're going to do some rows. So Kenny Mack, Dave Cutlinios, and anybody that can stay and help do that, you get three free sins for the rest of the day. Uh, there it is. Thank you for bringing. Some of you have already used them up, so you might as well take them. Uh, all right. Thank you for bringing clothes for the Christian Service Center. We got them in two trucks back there. That's awesome. Cleaned out your, I did exactly what Dan, Dan Lasich said to do. I went, I said, I, this shirt, I like that shirt, but I never wear that shirt. I put that shirt in the bag. So I want you to know I, I, I listen to him. I listen sometimes. All right, let me wrap this up. How many of you, as we think about the subject of evangelism, you go, I've tried it and I failed a million times, uh, you, right? You, I, not good at it. Uh, someone said this about golf. An interesting thing about golf is that no matter how badly you, you, you play, it's always possible to get worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is exactly why I gave up golf. And uh, uh, so, but never give up evangelism because ultimately it doesn't depend upon you. You're not a heart transformer. You are a good news teller. All right. We do some persuasion, Paul says. We do some explanation, but we got to stay in it. A couple of other quotes. Thomas Edison, I have, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. If you're doing evangelism, you will find a lot of ways that don't work. Good. Give them up. Try something that does. Tapping into manhood is one of them. No matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world, said Robin Williams sometimes before he hung himself. Ideas, truth changes the world. It does. And never forget that. The gospel changes the world. That great theologian Winston Churchill once said, who smoked cigars and started drinking scotch and bourbon in the morning at breakfast, my rule of life prescribed as an absolutely sacred right, smoking cigars and also drinking of alcohol before, after, and if need be during all meals and in the intervals between them. was his rule of life. I've never seen a picture of Winston Churchill without a cigar. If that had been my rule of life, I'd be dead. I don't know how he lived to the law. I don't know how he did it. He did. It was an anomaly. Don't follow that rule of life. Follow the rule of life that you are God's deeply beloved son. And you have good news to tell to the people. I almost couldn't sleep last night because just before going to bed, the thought occurred to me as I was getting ready to, to give this message today, the thought occurred to me that in, and I think it was the Holy Spirit, could have been indigestion, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think I heard these words, son, there is no better time in your entire life to evangelize men. And I thought about this. I've been here a long time. But never in my lifetime and not in my generation have I seen men more attacked. Have I seen more young men struggling with father wounds and wounds from a society. Never, ever in my lifetime Has it ever been a least manly time? Never is there a greater opportunity than right now for us to tell people that their earthly father doesn't define them. And that Jesus Christ has helped them to meet the heavenly father who will never abandon them. Never 
in my life have I ever seen there being a better time to evangelize men than right now? Why would we not take the risk to tell them about how God has become your father through Jesus Christ? How good he is in redeeming and building. How you now have a hope and a future. Now is the time. May, may God use you in ways that surprise you as you step out in faith. May God use us to reach the greater Orlando area in a lasting way. Our holy God, would you break our hearts for the men around us and the men who lead families, the men who feel beaten down, for the men who have become angry and mean and toxic, for the men who have withdrawn. Lord Jesus, would you give us your heart as you looked out over Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have come to you, but, but you would not. Lord, may we talk about you to men, and may you bring hundreds, thousands of men to bow the knee before you in the greater Orlando area. And may these men, with this newfound hope and joy in their heart, with this new father that they have, influence their wives, their children, their grandchildren, their churches, your world. Thank you that we get to be a part for such a time as this. We pray in your strong and powerful name. And all God's men said, amen. 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 Thank you.